Good afternoon and welcome to today's IAC webinar, Imaging and Aortopathy, Marfan and Loewy's Dietz Syndromes. My name is Kelly Baer and I'm the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, Use the questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar as we will monitor questions throughout the presentation and try to answer as many as possible during the Q&A period. Also on the left sidebar, please note the resources tab. Click this tab for a link to today's handout, a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select the file name to download the handout. Lastly, in the lower left of the player, Please note the request support button. If you experience any technical problems during this webinar, click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the notes tab. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for your choice of the ASRT CE or ASE CEU credit, you must be registered, logged into this webinar, then complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure you are also individually registered and logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have a record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. And we are joined today by our two presenters from the Department of Genetic Medicine at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland. We have with us Dr. Hal Dietz and physician assistant Katie Kashmer. Dr. Dietz is the Victor A. McCusick Professor of Medicine and Genetics at the Department of Genetic Medicine, as well as the, as the Departments of Pediatrics with appointments in Medicine and Molecular Biology and Genetics. Katie Kashmer is Physician Assistant with the Cardiac Connective Tissue Disorder Clinic in the Department of Genetic Medicine. And she is also a cardiac sonographer with Johns Hopkins Hospital. Both are experts in the field, and we are happy to have them with us today. Hmm. And with that said, I will now turn this webinar over to today's first speaker, Dr. Hal Dietz. Doctor? Hello, everyone. It's uh, really a pleasure um, to be with you today. I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity um, to present. Today, uh, we're going to talk about a phenotype um, that's uh, likely very familiar to all of you, um, aortic aneurysm. It is the cause of death for about 2% of people in industrialized countries. Now, when uh, we think of aortic aneurysm, we often think of more common presentations like abdominal aortic aneurysm, but the majority of genetically imposed aortic aneurysms, our topic for today, occur as discrete fusiform lesions of the aortic root with rapid taper to a more normal dimension in the distal ascending aorta. Now, common presentations of aortic aneurysm have been particularly difficult to model and to study due to lack of insight regarding their genetic etiology. Um, but fortunately, there are many Mendelian presentations of aortic aneurysm that are more experimentally tractable. Our approach has been to identify disease genes, create animal models of the disorder, and then try to interrogate uh, the underlying mechanism in that manner, uh, hoping to develop new treatment strategies. Fortunately, these mouse models of these vascular connective tissue disorders nicely recapitulate uh, most, if not all, aspects of the disease, uh, here shown by a mouse model of Loewy's Dietz syndrome uh, with marked dilatation at the sinuses of Alsalva. 
So there are uh, lots of genes that have been identified due to the hard work by the international community. Um, there are, in general, three major classes of genes and proteins that have been implicated in aneurysm formation. Um, you can group them uh, by virtue of their uh, uh, the gene product being present in the extracellular matrix. Uh, the gene product governing uh, the contractile machinery of vascular smooth muscle cells, or the gene product contributing directly to a cellular signaling pathway called um, the TGF beta signal signaling axis. And uh, these can, uh, the, the general category that a condition falls in can be somewhat predictive of the phenotype that you can expect. For example, uh, genes in the uh, extracellular matrix, when altered, uh, tend to cause syndromic um, arterial aneurysms. Uh, the TGF beta signaling pathway uh, typically causes syndromic root aneurysms with common involvement of um, other arteries. And smooth muscle contractile machinery alterations uh, generally lead to non syndromic uh, aortic aneurysms with a RIC risk of aortic tear or dissection. We're going to spend uh, quite a bit of time discussing Marfan syndrome, uh, which is a systemic disorder of connective tissue with autosomal dominant inheritance, meaning you only have to in inherit one abnormal copy of the gene uh, to have the condition. Uh, the syndrome shows pleiotropic manifestations in the ocular, skeletal, and cardiovascular systems including eye lens dislocation and overgrowth of the long bones, but most uh, importantly, progressive dilatation of the root of the aorta at the sinuses of Alsalva that essentially will lead to aortic tear, rupture, and early death if left untreated. We now know that um, the condition is caused by DNA changes, um, so-called mutations in the gene that encodes the extracellular matrix protein fibrillin-1. We know that uh, fibrillin-1 aggregates outside of cells to form complex structures that we call microfibrils, and that these cluster around the maturing ends of elastic fibers during embryonic growth. And elastic fiber is what allows a tissue like the aorta or the lung or the skin to stretch. Now, this simple relationship between microfibrils and elastic fibers led to the rather firm belief that you need a lattice of microfibrils to make an elastic fiber suggesting that it's already too late to try to make a difference once a child with Marfan syndrome has been born. Uh, but it was realized by us and others that this weak tissues hypothesis did not explain many of the manifestations of Marfan syndrome, like bone overgrowth or the craniofacial features or the low muscle mass and low fat stores that are so characteristic of the condition. So through a large body of work by many investigators, it's now recognized that microfibrils composed of fibrillin-1 serve a second important regulatory function in that they bind TGF-beta and contribute to suppressing its activation. In Marfan syndrome, when you have too few microfibrils, it leads to excessive release of this growth factor that binds to its receptor on the surface, uh, surface of cells and drives uh, cellular performance. So um, it's not so important about the details of the signaling cascade, uh, but while I, what I will emphasize in this talk is that conditions that are caused by the same general mechanism tend to look like each other. That has prognostic significance it also has uh, relevance to what type of imaging would be done, how often, and what treatment strategies might work best. So uh, we did reason that perhaps a class of medications called angiotensin receptor blockers, um, such as Lozartan, might be uh, protective in Marfan syndrome because others had shown that these medications can decrease the activity of TGF-beta, including in the blood vessels. 
Uh, we did a trial in Marfan mouse, uh, mouse models that was quite remarkable, showing complete suppression of abnormal aortic growth in Marfan mice that were treated with ARBs. Um, this uh, occurred in association with preservation of normal aortic wall architecture uh, with clear evidence that the TGF beta cascade had been suppressed. Um, to date, there have been many trials of ARBs in Marfan syndrome, and uh, recently a, a meta-analysis that included uh, the data from seven of these trials in about 1,500 patients really showed very convincing evidence that ARB treatment was associated uh, with protection from uh, aortic root and more distal ascending aortic growth when compared to placebo. And when ARBs were added to beta blockers, um, that it had a very dramatic effect on so slowing aortic growth when compared to beta blockers alone. Also, a, a Dutch study recently reported a long-term follow-up of their Marfan trial in adults. Uh, they had previously shown that ARBs can suppress aortic growth, but here they showed that it also uh, helps to prevent deleterious outcomes like operations, aortic tear, and mortality. So um, in, it looks like this is uh, really uh, a, a good step forward in the care of people with Marfan syndrome. How do we image these folks? Well, <clears throat> as I mentioned, aneurysms tend to be confined to the aortic root, at least early in life. Um, so echocardiography is really the mainstay. Um, it should be performed annually for stable aortic aneurysms um, with shorter intervals if aortic dimensions are progressive or if the dimension is approaching a surgical threshold, which we'll talk about. So um, at around uh, young adulthood, uh, when someone's reaching uh, around the age of 16 to 18, we begin to look at the whole aorta with either MRA or CTA, um, for, uh, and we perform that uh, assessment about every two years, perhaps a little bit more frequently if there are any concerning, uh, concerning findings. Uh, we do initiate broader imaging uh, with MRA or CTA at a younger age if aortic root surgery has already been performed because we do know that this can actually increase the predisposition uh, for dilatation of the more distal ascending aorta um, or the proximal uh, descending thoracic aorta. There's also uh, a, a meaningful incidence of type B dissections um, after aortic root repair. So uh, MRA or CTA would be part of uh, the surveillance uh, for that issue. And general uh, surgery is considered in Marfan syndrome when the root reaches about five centimeters. Uh, the favored surgical approach is now a valve sparing um, aortic root replacement. Given the rarity of aortic tears in childhood, really um, almost uh, unheard of in classic Marfan syndrome, similar size thresholds are applied. So even in a three, four, five-year-old, uh, we would let the aortic root get uh, close to five centimeters before deciding to move forward. We would consider earlier intervention with a very aggressive family history, people that were tearing their aorta at young ages. Um, if the aorta, a aortic root was growing really fast, greater than about a half to one centimeter per year, or with the emergence of significant aortic regurgitation. Given that we want to try to save the aortic valve, we don't want to allow this to progress to a severe aortic regurgitation, <clears throat> which might not be uh, amenable to, to remodeling at the time of surgery. In kids, there's a strong incentive to try to achieve an aortic annulus dimension of at least two to 2.2 centimeters prior to surgery to allow placement of a graft of sufficient size to accommodate body growth. If you did the surgery at a smaller annulus size, we're only able to put in a smaller graft, 
in, in essence, you'd be committing that child to a revision um, uh, sometime during growth. So back in around 2004, 2005, uh, my good friend and colleague Bart Lowys and I recognized and described a new aortic aneurysm syndrome that had many features in common with Marfan syndrome, like curvature of the spine, chest wall deformity, long fingers, and aortic root aneurysm but also the potential for many unique features, including uh, hypertelorism, uh, as in essence, widely spaced eyes, a cleft palate or a bifid uvula in the back of the throat, um, premature skull fusion, club foot deformity, and certain types of congenital heart disease like patent ductus arteriosus bicuspid aortic valve or ASD. Most importantly, um, these kids um, can have a very aggressive, diffuse arteriopathy with widespread arterial tortuosity and diffuse aneurysms, not just at the root, but at other locations. For example, here showing a subclavian artery aneurysm. And most concerning, these uh, aneurysms tend to rupture at um, younger ages and smaller dimensions uh, when compared to Marfan syndrome. And we've had the privilege um, just at Johns Hopkins of caring for more than 300 families with this condition that's now referred to as Lowy's Dietz syndrome. Now, as you might expect, a, a condition that looks an awful lot like Marfan syndrome in many ways, it turns out this also relates to altered TGF beta signaling. Um, here, the mutations are in either of the two subunits that, in, uh, that are, make up the receptor for TGF-beta, either the type 1 or type 2 receptor. Um, these uh, cause a, now a condition more specifically referred to as Lowy's Dietz syndrome, type 1 or type 2, respectively. I want to, uh, you know, people are going to encounter uh, folks with Lowy's Dietz syndrome in their practice. And um, I wanted to briefly review the, the systemic findings of this disorder. Um, as I mentioned, uh, craniosynostosis or premature skull fusion is relatively common, widely spaced eyes seen in the majority of people. Cleft palate in about a quarter, but some flavor of uvula abnormality in most. Uh, and that can range from a broad uvula to a uvula that's not quite split, but has a midline crease or so-called raffe down the middle, to a uvula that has a split tip or to someone you know, who essentially has uh, a uvula that's so split that it appears like two separate structures. Um, the uvula can also be uh, just simply long in people with Lowy's Dietz syndrome. Um, a, a very classic uh, uh, appearance of children in early childhood includes um, this apparent vein crossing the nasal bridge. It's simply because the skin is more translucent than normal, so you can see the underlying veins. You can see that many of these children have a dusky or blue appearance to the sclera, to the white of the eye, again, because you're simply seeing the, the veins underneath. Many of these kids have some form of strabismus, generally exotropia, um, that we'll talk about a bit more later on. Skeletal features are highly prevalent. Um, long fingers, joint contractures, um, club foot in about a third. Um, most have, uh, have flat feet and some flavor of chest wall deformity, including uh, pectus carinatum or pectus excavatum. Also uh, scoliosis um, is quite common. Now, some things can be really important to assess for, to recognize and to manage. Quite a few people with Lowy's Dietz syndrome have some form of cervical spine malformation or instability. Um, it can be identified in all age groups. Um, in many, as in this young girl, there is a need for surgical stabilization uh, of the spine um, and repair can be complicated by poor bone healing. 
But certainly at diagnosis, we would recommend flexion and extension neck films um, to look for malformation or instability. And that should certainly be performed before the first uh, general anesthesia, before uh, intubation um, would be uh, considered. Many of these kids, about 60%, have a, a strong allergic tendency. Um, in general, it's the same types of allergens as seen in the general population, some nuts and shellfish, uh, things like that. Um, also very common environmental sensitivities. Reactions can be very sudden and very severe. Um, many of our patients require uh, use um, of an EpiPen. There's also an increased incidence of other allergic manifestations such as asthma and eczema. And then about 10% uh, or so um, of the people that we care for with this condition um, have a sig significant form of gastrointestinal inflammation, um, infiltration of eosinophils in the esophagus, so-called eosinophilic esophagitis is most common but at the most severe end of the spectrum, uh, we see uh, what appears to be classic inflammatory bowel disease. Dental anomalies, yes, part of LDS. Ophthalmologic findings tend to be relatively mild, but there is a small but significant risk of retinal detachment that people need to know about. Um, low dense, uh, bone density and a risk for pathologic fracture is relatively common. Um, as are uh, severe headaches, often with a, a migraine quality. And we certainly would recommend avoidance of uh, vasoconstrictors such as triptans um, that are used uh, for the treatment of migraines because of uh, their potential deleterious influence on uh, the vasculature. I mentioned tortuosity is uh, quite common and quite severe in many circumstances, it tends to be most prominent in the neck vessels, including the carotids and vertebrals, uh, but can be seen throughout the arterial circulation. Initially, we worried um, that it might predispose to kinking of arteries and, and clinical events, uh, but that simply didn't pan out. It, it tends to be a diagnostic marker of the disease but does not tend to lead directly to complications. Now, uh, a colleague, Shane Morris, uh, recognized that this might be used, uh, this tortuosity might um, give prognostic information. Um, she described a method to generate what's called a vertebral tortuosity index. Uh, where you measure the actual length of the vertebral arteries, and then you measure the span that uh, would, you know, that a straight line occupies, and index the actual length to the um, to the uh, straight line uh, distance, um, giving you the so-called VTI. Uh, there are examples along the top, ranging from very mild a VTI of eight. Um, to this uh, patient with the classic appearance of Loewy's Dietz syndrome with a VTI all the way up at 190. An elevation in VTI can be seen in other vascular connective tissue disorders. Um, it tends to be uh, more mild than what's observed in Loewy's Dietz syndrome. You'll notice the average for uh, these young patients with Marfan syndrome was around 25 whereas the average in patients with Loewy's Dietz syndrome was up around 75 and extended all the way up to close to 200. <clears throat> uh, if you just look at VTI um, and look at freedom from surgery, you see that low uh, VTI um, had a, 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 a lower incidence of uh, early surgery and as VTI increased, uh, the incidence for surgery in, at young ages went up. Um, there seemed to be added value to consider both the size of the aortic root and the VTI in combination. It gave a little bit more granularity. <clears throat> and uh, it, at the extremes, if you look at, you know, just at VTIs less than 50, as would be typical for Marfan syndrome, or VTIs greater than 50, which gets into the Loewy's Dietz spectrum, you see that there is a, a, a correlation with freedom from uh, death. You know, it, uh, there seems to be prognostic significance 
that extends to mortality. Um, aneurysms at the time of diagnosis, um, almost always at the root. Um, other locations throughout the aorta can be seen. Um, at, at the time of diagnosis, of, uh, aneurysms beyond the aorta are relatively common. Um, so we would certainly recommend doing an MRA or CTA uh, from the head through the pelvis um, at the time of diagnosis. And then an MRA, uh, again, spanning from head to pelvis about every two years um, or more frequently based upon initial findings. <laughs> now, interestingly, um, the location that aneurysms, um, locations that aneurysms are seen in LDS are distinctly non-random, that there are hot spots. Um, we've talked about the aortic root a lot, but um, these hot spots also include the proximal subclavian arteries, much less commonly the base of the carotids, uh, for example, um, the proximal dis, uh, descending thoracic aorta, um, the abdominal aorta, and for some uh, reason, the base of the superior mesenteric artery and the celiac axis, but for example, not the base of the renal arteries. It turns out every one of these hot spots for aneurysms in Loewy's Dietz syndrome represents a place where vascular smooth muscle cells of different embryonic origin interface with each other. So at the root, at the subclavian, in the descending thoracic and abdominal aorta, and at the uh, base of the celiac and superior mesenteric. Another place uh, aneurysms uh, are observed um, with, uh, with some regularity uh, are ductal aneurysms um, in patients with uh, Loewy's Dietz syndrome. Uh, cerebrovascular lesions uh, certainly are seen, can be seen in childhood, and require dedicated monitoring. So uh, that is why uh, we absolutely recommend uh, imaging that includes the head uh, on a regular basis. So other cardiovascular findings, we talked about PDA, BAV, ASD. Um, as you might imagine in a connective tissue disorder with overlap with Marfan syndrome, mitral valve prolapse is also fairly common, although in general less severe than what's seen in Marfan syndrome. Um, aortic dissection at diagnosis is relatively common. Mean age about 24 years, but importantly, a, a difference from Marfan syndrome is that the age of dissection ranges down into early childhood, even infancy. Um, we do see some bias for earlier dissections in males, um, as in a, a number of other aortopathies. Um, and uh, again, the, the sites of dissection uh, extend throughout the vascular tree. So uh, elective uh, aortic, aortic root repair, fortunately, has proven quite safe and very effective in this population. Um, we typically uh, would uh, consider repair uh, when the aortic root is uh, somewhere uh, around four centimeters. We'll, we'll talk about that a bit more. Yeah. Um, and when I say that um, uh, they're safe, you know, in uh, the superb experience by Duke Cameron and Luca Vercella at Hopkins um, in their uh, 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 surgical series, uh, there have been no uh, uh, in-hospital deaths with elective root repairs for Loewy's Dietz syndrome. Uh, there have been no uh, late deaths in elective repairs, um, and total operative death, deaths um, include two uh, uh, patients, uh, both with fairly complicated um, uh, uh, disease, uh, uh, the re uh, need for a redo arch repair or uh, repair of an extensive type B dissection. So medical management um, in mouse models of Loewy's Dietz syndrome, ARBs work just as beautifully as they do in Marfan syndrome. Uh, we do use ARBs as our first ch choice drugs, um, and we use aggressive dosing. We're really trying to get to the very upper end of the dosing range. 
uh, routine exercise restrictions, avoid contact sports, competitive sports to the point of exhaustion, and isometric activities. Uh, and as we've mentioned, frequent and widespread imaging. In the most severe kids, severe mutations, severe craniofacial features, severe vertebral tortuosity index, um, you know, we might choose to move ahead when, as soon as the annulus reaches about two centimeters. Slightly less severe patients, um, even children, uh, we'd let the root get to at or about four centimeters. And the least predisposed patients with uh, Lowy's Dietz syndrome type one or two, we'd still go before five centimeters, perhaps four and a half centimeters. <clears throat> Surgical management of other aneurysms and dissections, it depends on the place, it, it's, uh, it depends on the accessibility and the risk of repair, but in general, you'd use a somewhat more aggressive approach than you would for the same aneurysm in someone that did not have Lowy's Dietz syndrome. And both operative and in rare circumstances, endovascular approaches are considered, and endovascular approaches um, more commonly might be considered um, in the in the head, there is a, a now getting to be a little bit old um, a review that goes through our thoughts on uh, caring for patients um, with Lowy's Dietz syndrome. Um, that uh, I, I do recommend uh, as a, a, an ongoing valuable resource. So in the past, <clears throat> what we've done is we've tried to determine what works best for the average patient with a condition. But I think now in this you know, new age of uh, what we hope to be precision medicine, we're more often asking what will work best for this patient sitting in front of me. Um, and what we have recognized is that there are some mutations in the TGFBR1 or TGFBR2 gene that are really bad actors. We've um, we've learned that they do require special attention. You have to take notice. Um, perhaps the one that gives us the most anxiety um, is, uh, occurs in the TGFBR2 gene at position 528. And the specific mutation um, is that an arginine that normally occurs at position 528 is changed to a histidine or cysteine. Um, either one will also will cause this very severe presentation. And not only um, is it the most severe mutation, unfortunately, it's also the most common recurrent mutation. Overall, we've seen about 19 folks uh, with this mutation, all required root surgery in childhood, all required a second surgery, surgery generally for ascending or subclavian aneurysm, pseudoaneurysm or dissection, Half required a third surgery, many a fourth, and about one third um, have died during um, childhood, often with type B dissections. Um, we have uh, we now have a patient that's reached um, her twenties uh, with this mutation, um, but it's really um, a, a, a a bad actor. Now, here's an example of. Uh, uh, imaging that was performed uh, for surveillance in a patient with this particular mutation. And just routine surveillance imaging um, 11 months later uh, showed the emergence of this giant subclavian artery aneurysm that required um, immediate intervention. Uh, here's an example of a, a young patient who had aortic root repair and showed this very aggressive development of an ascending aortic aneurysm after root repair. An example of a, a patient that had a very a severe descending aortic dissection, in fact, a circumferential um, dissection that involved the entire descending aorta. Uh, here's the facial appearance of some of the kids um, with this mutation. You can see that the craniofacial features are, um, are quite striking, um, as was their VTI. You know, others have described similar experience with this mutation. It's not just in our hands. Um, here's a patient managed by um, Scott Lemaire and Joe Caselli uh, down in Texas. And uh, as you can see, he required many, many surgical repairs 
with aneurysms at uh, all of the locations um, that I've described. Uh, another young patient um, managed by um, Denver Sele in uh, Atlanta uh, required early uh, root repair, converted uh, to a bentol at three years of age, uh, then had ascending transverse uh, and transverse aortic dissection with contained rupture at 10 years of age, now developing these really massive coronary artery aneurysms that are common in people with vascular connective tissue disorders, but they don't typically get to this size and not, not as fast. Um, we now know that there's a broad spectrum of Loewy's deep syndrome. There's now a total of six genes, so six different types. You know, the same theme applies, same craniofacial features in most of these folks, uh, prominent skeletal involvement, uh, prominent aortic root involvement in many types, you know, perhaps with the exception of type six, um, you do see many aneurysms throughout um, the arterial circulation. Um, there is uh, also a condition that looks a, a lot like um, Marfan and Loewy's Dietz syndrome called Sprintz and Goldberg syndrome. Different gene also relates to the TGF beta signaling pathway. These folks have, uh, as I mentioned, all the typical features we've discussed including um, uh, aortic root aneurysm. The root aneurysms are more rare and less severe than in the other conditions. Um, these folks also ha uniquely have highly penetrant um, developmental disabilities. So that, that is really what makes them stand out as different. So we got three different conditions look an awful lot alike. Um, that makes sense because they all relate to perturbation of the same cellular signaling pathway. A few unique features that will tip you off clinically, like lens dislocation is only seen in Marfan syndrome. Intellectual disability is only seen in Sprintz and Goldberg syndrome. Um, but you know, once you uh, see a patient um, like this, and define the gene, it will help you uh, make decisions about where to image, how often to image, and, uh, and how to care for that individual. There is, there, so there are diagnosis and gene-specific principles. Uh, Sprintz and Goldberg, low incidence and severity of issues. So image intermittently, reserve medical management um, unless it's specifically indicated. Marfan, you can bet that there is going to be root aneurysm, um, but they, uh, these aneurysms tend to behave the ruled, so dissection greater than five centimeters. As I mentioned, echo yearly in childhood, um, but uh, begin imaging the entire aorta in adulthood or after root surgery. And then LDS, <clears throat> you're going to be imaging with echo um, certainly every year at least. Um, we're going to be looking at the whole arterial tree, including the head, unlike these other disorders. Um, you can bet that there will be a gradient of severity. So types one and two are the worst. Types five and six are the more most mild, with uh, three and four being somewhere in between. Um, root surgery should occur less than five centimeters in all types, about four centimeters in types one and two. And uh, we uh, use uh, medications and uh, image uh, frequently in, uh, in all of these folks. So our uh, last uh, uh, condition that I'm going to spend a significant time with is called vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Unlike all the others, this does not relate to TGF-beta. The mutations are in the matrix protein type 3 collagen. You know, as you might predict, they look very different. Um, they ha don't have root aneurysms as a general concern. In fact, it's, it's rare to see root aneurysms. And if you're seeing a family with multiple people with root aneurysms, you could bet it's not going to be vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Instead, these folks get aneurysms and dissections and ruptures anywhere throughout the arterial tree. Um, these uh, aneurysms can rupture, uh, in fact, often rupture without any prior enlargement. 
uh, I'm sorry, not, not aneurysms, but arteries. Um, the risk of, uh, there's also risk of rupture of the, uh, of hollow organs, including the, uh, the bowel and the, the pregnant uterus. Um, there uh, are high, uh, uh, there is a high risk of operative complications. Um, we'll talk about that a bit. Also, uh, a, a, a risk of a very serious event called the carotid cavernous sinus fistula that would present with a red, bulging, painful eye. And, uh, and as I mentioned, in general, the aortic root is spared in this condition. Um, there can be mitral valve prolapse and occasional root involvement, so we generally perform an echocardiogram on a yearly basis. Most often, it's not very uh, exciting, um, but because of the risk of aneurysms, pseudoaneurysms, dissections, and ruptures throughout the whole arterial tree, um, we do perform a CTA at diagnosis um, and an MRA from head through pelvis um, every one to two years with more frequent imaging based on initial findings. You know, it, surgery in vascular EDS <laughs> is an area of active investigation and continues to evolve. The historical view with it were, uh, was that the tissues are so fragile that you don't do anything until the situation is quite dire and you're pretty sure that the patient would uh, die within an hour if nothing were done. And um, as you might imagine, under those circumstances, the operative outcomes were awful. So the view was challenged by the observation that many patients with this condition had had successful interventions prior to being diagnosed. And on this basis, a more proactive mindset has now been widely adopted. Um, elective surgery is still not a casual practice, um, but uh, now there's uh, frequent imaging and earlier intervention, uh, including, as I mentioned, um, both um, the, the largely open uh, vascular procedures very occasionally an endovascular procedure might be considered as a urgent life-saving uh, event, but in, as in other uh, vascular connective tissue disorders, endovascular approaches are generally avoided. Uh, this is a table for reference. I don't, I'm not going to go through this in detail now, um, but it tells you the different physical findings and uh, the different conditions, and so what you can expect. And as you can see, the middle uh, conditions, the spectrum of Loewy's Dietz syndrome look more like each other than they do the matrix disorders such as Marfan syndrome or type 3 collagen deficiency. Um, but uh, again, this, uh, this is something that um, you can re uh, refer to and uh, it's something that uh, will need to be updated as we learn more. Uh, sometimes you see that the major predisposition happens in the more distal ascending aorta, not so much at the root. Um, in fact, this is the typical presentation of aortic enlargement that associates um, with bicuspid aortic valve, um, which is seen in about 1% to 2% of people in the population. The cause of bicuspid valve with ascending aneurysm is largely mysterious despite a lot of effort. It's not giving up its secrets easily. Uh, we do know that in rare cases, you can find mutations in notch one, especially in people that have early and aggressive valve calcification. You can also see rare mutations in a gene called SMAD6 or Robo4, and again, a strong, strong male predominance. Now, a different uh, twist on this comes with a syndromic presentation of ascending aortic aneurysm. These kids not only have dramatic um, aneurysms in young, early in life um, at the ascending aorta, they have significant tortuosity, um, have a loose, uh, almost sagging skin. Um, this is a form of so-called cutis laxa, um, so-called loose skin. Uh, with prominent uh, skin, lung, and GI findings. Um, it is early uh, in onset and aggressive, requires early surgical management, does respond to ARBs, at least in mouse models, uh, with a good short-term response to surgery. 
you're going to see things that are clearly syndromic, um, but difficult to explain. Um, my suggestion would be to look for patterns. Um, in this young man, uh, he uh, had had repair of tetralogy of flow in infancy, also had a cleft mitral valve, had uh, many other features, in con including congenital short gut and low platelets. Um, he turns out um, to have a mutation in a gene called filament A. And the reason why you don't see a lot of people like this young man is because in most circumstances, a male who has a mutation in uh, filament A would experience fetal demise. Um, it, this is an X-linked gene. So in men, there's only one copy of this gene. If it's abnormal, it's generally incompatible with life. Somehow this young man got by, but has very severe manifestations that overlap what you can see uh, in women that have um, heterozygous mutations in this gene, including seizures. Um, echo, I'm going to just briefly go through the advantages and disadvantages of different imaging modalities. Echo, as you know, widely available and safe, can assess morphology and function simultaneously. It assesses most concerns in Marfan syndrome, and it's useful as an adjunct in LDS and vascular EDS. Disadvantages cannot image all relevant regions. On-axis views can sometimes be difficult and complicated by pectus, scoliosis, emphysema, tortuosity, and uh, all the other things that we've talked about. <clears throat> Um, there are multiple methods to measure the aortic root by echocardiography. Most pediatric centers use inner edge to inner edge in systole. Um, many adult centers use leading edge to leading edge in diastole. It's really not all that important about which method is used. What is important is to be consistent and to standardize to normal values for the method, age, and body size under consideration. There's a great resource on the Marfan Foundation webpage that gives you a Z-score calculator for children using the inner edge to inner edge method and for adults using the leading edge to leading edge method. So I, I would recommend this site strongly. Um, there are some challenges. Uh, for unexplained reasons, we often see asymmetric enlargement of the aortic root, most commonly, most prominently involving the non-coronary um, uh, sinus. Uh, it can result in wide variation in measurements uh, from various parasternal views, with high parasternal views often associated with, with artificially big dimensions um, due to off-axis measurements. MRA um, benefits, doesn't require radiation or um, iodinated contrast, takes a long time to do these studies. Kids will definitely need to be sedated or even under general anesthesia. Some facilities require you to schedule multiple appointments even on different days uh, for different body parts. Uh, motion artifact can be challenging. Uh, some folks, uh, especially with renal insufficiency, um, have difficulties with the contrast. Um, and there can be ambiguity with MRA, when, especially when assessing small vascular lesions in the head, you know, with great uh, consternation about whether something represents an aneurysm or uh, a, a normal variant, a so-called infundibulum. CTA, really fast. High resolution images often used to resolve the aneurysm versus infundibulum question. Widespread availability, but does require radiation exposure. And that's an important consideration for a population that will need surveillance for a lifetime. Um, also, uh, the contrast uh, agent um, can be problematic in, in people with allergies or kidney problems. I want to end by giving a shout out to my friend and colleague, Elliot Fishman um, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he's a tremendous resource for interpreting the CTAs uh, for our patients. He's also created this wonderful website, CT is Us, um, that uh, has many, many hundreds of beautiful uh, images um, of patients with all different diagnoses, but uh, really nice representation of vascular connective tissue disorders. So I would refer you there. 
Um, <clears throat> I want to end by um, thanking many people. Um, Katie Kashmir, my partner in crime for this presentation, will be participating in the question and answer session. Uh, Gretchen McCarrick uh, also uh, gave uh, a lot of help with this. Um, she is our genetic counselor for our clinic and uh, really uh, um, a, a critical member of our team. Um, the clinicians who um, you know help care for the vascular and systemic manifestations of all these conditions, and then our uh, <clears throat> our colleagues um, who focus on uh, on uh, helping us interpret imaging. Um, I thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to try to take some questions. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Dietz. And at this time, we will begin the Q&A session. From IAC, I'd like to introduce our own Katie Gibson, our Director of Accreditation for Echocardiography. She'll be assisting with the Q&A session today. Katie, would you like to start us off? Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you again, Dr. Dietz and Katie, uh, for this fantastic presentation. Um, we have a lot of great questions coming in, so I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, this is a great one regarding including uh, Lois Dietz syndrome in a differential when reading CTs. Are there any instances of aortopathy without any outward manifestations? Yes. Um, so the, as was mentioned, the severity of Lois Dietz syndrome is a spectrum. Um, it's a spectrum based upon the potential involvement of at least six genes and likely more. Um, it's also a spectrum that, uh, with what, what you can see for involvement of any given gene. So for example, in TGFBR2, I described one of the most severe mutations um, in some patients with TGFBR2 mutations, we see subtle um, findings later in life. Um, so I would maintain an index of suspicion. Um, sometimes arterial tortuosity can be a real um, giveaway, the, the severity uh, that's observed. Um, sometimes it's subtle craniofacial abnormalities. Um, the uvula has tipped me off more than once, <laughs> um, you know, based upon, um, you know, a, a surprise when I look in someone's mouth. Um, so I, I, it should be in a differential diagnosis, even if there are not um, uh, overt uh, outward features um, of LDS. Gotcha. I'm going to aim this question at Katie because I know she really wants to answer it. Do you <laughs> allow your patients to go on roller coasters or simulator rides? So we do have concerns with roller coaster riding, um, especially the ones that have abrupt acceleration and deceleration. Uh, in the words of Dr. Deeds, if you're looking at a roller coaster and all of a sudden your heart rate goes up and you're starting to sweat and you are just unsure about it, it's probably a good idea not to uh, go on that roller coaster. Um, the smoother roller coasters um, are often more preferred. Gotcha. I'm going to throw another one your way, Katie. Um, what would you add to a standard echo protocol in a cardiology lab in order to identify uh, possible low ease deets patients? Would you ever take a peek at the vertebrals or the subclavians or just do what you normally do? <laughs> so if um, you're proficient at imaging um, the vertebrals and subclavian arteries, um, some uh, diagnosis can be made um, by echo, but it can be difficult with the aortic tortuosity that can be seen in Lois Dietz syndrome. Gotcha. And can you exercise with dilated aortic aneurysms if you're on beta blockers or yes, what kind actually, of, oh, yes. sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> So what are your uh, recommendations for exercise restrictions? Yeah, so cardiovascular uh, exercise is actually encouraged. Um, we don't normally focus on a heart rate, just only the perceived effort of exercise. So uh, cardiova cardiovascular exercise naturally helps lower blood pressure, which decreases the hemodynamic stress on already compromised um, aortic walls. Um, so any kind of uh, suicide type of uh, running is probably not that great. We encourage any kind of cardiovascular exercise that you can kind of string along 
um, a few words and have a little bit of a conversation. Uh, those are the types of cardiovascular exercises we um, prefer. Gotcha. And I, I just add, I, you know, as was mentioned, the, we, what we're most concerned about is muscle straining, you know, the Valsalva maneuver bearing down um, and, and sustaining um, uh, straining. Um, so uh, we uh, also recommend that when people are doing that type of activity that might progress to uh, excessive straining, that they also make sure that they can talk through the activity. Um, if you're if you're talking, you're not performing a Valsalva maneuver. Um, would you perform perform screening echocardiograms on the siblings and other family members of Lois Dietz syndrome patients? Is that is that for me, Katie? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's Katie. <laughs> um, so um, in general, the answer is yes. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it does depend. You know, if a child presents with, um, you know, classic severe outward features of Lois Dietz syndrome in infancy, um, we find their mutation and we demonstrate that neither parent has the mutation, that, um, that it is a so-called sporadic or de novo mutation that occurred um, during uh, the formation of egg or sperm cells that contributed to conception. You know, in that circumstance, if we see a 14-year-old sibling who has no feature of Lois Dietz syndrome, um, we, we might not um, pursue either genetic testing or um, imaging surveillance. But in more subtle presentations of Lois Dietz syndrome, if um, you know, we don't yet know how the genetics is playing out in a given family, if there's any suspicion that uh, a sibling shows um, some, at least some features of a systemic connective tissue disorder, um, we would we would go ahead with imaging. I see. Um, I'm going to throw another one Katie's way. Do you have any imaging tips for sonographers to share on how to optimize echo images um, when they're measuring the aortic root, when you're scanning through a pectus or other chest wall abnormalities? Yeah, with these patients, um, with those that have a severe um, pectus excavatum or car carinatum, um, it is extremely difficult. You might have to go to a different intercostal space to try to get um, a view of the aortic root and even um, the more um, harder imaging of the ascending aorta. Um, you know, with those patients, it's just, you can, it's almost like you can take what you can get um, because those, those images generally give you an off axis view of the aortic root, um, making it difficult to measure the root perpendicular um, to the flow of the aorta and the walls of the aorta. Um, so if they're not perpendicular, they can give us um, different measurements. Yeah. So one thing I, I, I might add is if sometimes the aortic root is really um, for lack of a better word, wonky in shape on a long axis view. And, you know, there's a tendency, your eye gets caught by the biggest uh, uh, bulge of both sinuses that you're viewing. And, uh, you know, so, uh, on, on that basis, a tendency to make uh, oblique cuts along the aorta. What we try our best to do, and Katie and I spent a long time staring at these images, trying to come up with the, the best place to measure, we try to make sure that we're equidistant from the annulus um, when we're measuring across the aorta, that we're not um, making a, 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 an oblique cut that goes from close to the annulus uh, on one side, on the anterior side, and far away from the annulus, for example, on the posterior side. I see. I think we have time for one more question. Um, what is your approach for young patients who do not meet the criteria for a named connective tissue disorder, but they have some of the features and but they have a negative family history and maybe a normal echo. So let's say they have um, this flat feet, scoliosis, things like that. 
So we would, um, in that circumstance, uh, certainly consider genetic testing. Um, there are uh, now panels that are relatively inexpensive. Um, insurance does generally does a pretty good job at covering most, if not all, of the cost. You know, surveys uh, perhaps now getting to around thirty genes that we know can cause aortic aneurysm. If um, someone has a really severe uh, childhood presentation of aneurysm and the genetic panel comes back negative, uh, we might now consider uh, something called whole exome sequencing, uh, where all 23,000 genes um, are sequenced simultaneously um, to try to learn more about the etiology and uh, and make our you know best effort at, at tailoring management to that ind- individual. But I, I think gen- from what's being described as some connective tissue features, no clear answer. Um, genetic testing would uh, would clearly be indicated. Well, thank you again, Dr. Dietz. Um, this is, was a fascinating presentation. You're getting lots of compliments in the Q and A section, and uh, thank you, Katie, for uh, also interjecting your experience in here. It's really valuable to the sonographers. Um, And I'm going to kick it back to Kelly because she's got some information uh, regarding getting your CME. So you want to stay tuned for that. Thank you again. Thanks, everyone. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you again, uh, everyone. And a very special thank you to our guest presenters, Dr. Dietz and Katie Cashmer for their presentation today. Please feel free to contact IAC with any questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. To receive continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. On the left side of the My Account page, you'll click on webinars, look for the title of this session, Imaging in Aortopathy, Marfan and Lois Dietz Syndromes. Beneath this title, you will click Review Event. On the left, select the Evaluation tab, then click Take Evaluation to complete the survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and anytime thereafter through the CE Transcript section on the My Account page. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and appreciate your participation.